Welcome to our Circular Fit Outs Toolkit for Officers. So I think we'll get started because we've got a lot to cover. Um, so hi everyone, my name's Katie Shamus. I'm joining you from the City of Sydney today um, and welcome you on behalf of the City and the Better Buildings Partnership. Before we get into the content for today, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country across Australia. I'm joining you from the lands of the Darug people today and I want to pay my respects to their elders past and present and recognise their continuous connection to land, skies and water. And I also want to pay my respects to the various countries and elders that you all join from today. Um, Australia's first people. Okay. So I'll hand over now to our first presenter, um, Janaki, who will give a little bit of an introduction about the Better Buildings Partnership um, before we get into the content with GBCA and um, Oricon and the team. Thanks, Janaki. Hello, everyone. It's lovely to have you here today. Um, I am the Group Sustainability Manager at Charter Hall Group. And today I'm here in my capacity as the chair of the Better Building Partnership Circular Economy Working Group. I'll just give you a real quick background on the Better Building Partnership. The Better Building Partnership was established um, in 2011. So over 10 years ago, it's a collaboration of leading property owners and industry in influencers um, providing green leadership and sustainability innovation for office buildings um, here in the city of Sydney, but right across Australia as well. Um, the BBB has a track record of delivering real impact uh, and it does so by providing practical tools and guides on climate action, resilience and circular economy, the, key, the three key working groups within the Better Building Partnership. Um, within the Circular Economy Working Group, I've had the privilege of working with um, a number of uh, organizations that you'll hear from shortly in developing this fantastic, really practical tool, um, which addresses materials and waste in a circular economy framework. Um, BBP have been working on waste right from its inception. Um, we've developed the best practice operations waste guidelines. Um, this has informed the neighbours' waste rating as well as GECA certification of waste contractors. And our current project, which is the Circular Fitouts tool, builds on um, the strip out waste guidelines that was previously provided and available on the BBP website. Links to all of these documents will be provided um, in the chat. Um, this circular fit out toolkit has been created by industry for industry. It takes a holistic approach that considers energy, materials, and water in an office fit out right from the start in the planning and design phase through to procurement decision making. Um, and there's a lot of work that this group has done in creating a consultative approach in developing this toolkit and integrating with existing tools and frameworks within the industry that you all are familiar with. I will now hand over to Gabby from the GBCA who will present the Green Star Fit Out Rating Toolkit and she will talk to the intersection of this toolkit with the Green Star um, Interiors Toolkit. Thanks, Gabby. Hi everyone. I'm Gabrielle, the Technical Advisor from the Green Building Council of Australia. And the GBCA have supported the creation of this BBP Circular Fitouts Toolkit. And this is because we are really aligned in our vision to make circular fitouts the norm. So we have worked together to ensure that this toolkit is hugely helpful for those involved in fitouts. We're also working to enable use of this toolkit to assist projects in achieving Green Star Interiors ratings and in the future Green Star Fitouts ratings. And just as a bit of a heads up for anyone who does not know, uh, Green Star is an internationally recognised rating system, so it sets a standard for healthy, resilient, positive buildings and places. Our current rating tool for interiors, called Green Star Interiors, has played a really significant role in transforming the standards of fit-outs across many sectors, and we'll look to introduce an innovation challenge to award points based on using this circular fit-outs toolkit. And now as we look to update this rating tool over the coming year, the next version, which will be called Green Star Fitouts, will continue to take a holistic approach to assessing fitouts, but really include a focus on circularity. 
So this reading tool will look at the implementation of circular design and construction principles and the use of uh, responsible products, as well as how fit outs contribute to health, address environmental issues and contribute to the social health of the community. And our vision is that world leading green star rated fit outs will exemplify a new approach to designing and building, deconstructing and then reusing fit outs. And this circular fit outs toolkit provides a really fantastic and practical guidance to firstly help understand what circular fit outs mean and then what needs to be done to create one. So I'll pass over to Jenny now to run you through the toolkit. Thank you, Gabby. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jenny Philip, and I'm joining you from Oregon today. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of introduction about the, the reason for this project to have been uh, conducted. Better Building Partnerships, uh, as it was introduced with the Great Building Council of Australia, were really keen to find ways to improve circularity outcomes for fit out for offices. Um, what's been really fantastic, and Gabby already mentioned this, is that a joint approach across, you know, very significant big bodies looking to create something consistent and coherent for industry. So while this is led, um, you know, by Better Buildings Partnership, which is located in New South Wales, we really looked at making the toolkit applicable across the whole nation, which is really exciting. The reason why the toolkit was um, created in the first place is that we have many challenges around fit outs. Uh, it's quite a wasteful process and it, the, the lifespan is quite short, five to seven years with fast and around requirements. Uh, in that context, um, there's a lot of um, waste generated. There's a challenge around proper logistics being available and assets are being replaced before the end of life. Uh, and there's also challenges around costs related to that waste production. On the other hand, there are also a range of um, targets and, and ambitions that tenants and building owners need to really uh, achieve, particularly around carbon emission reduction. And we felt like um, we needed to connect the, that waste reduction target together with carbon emission reduction. So the toolkit sort of kept in mind those um, multi-pronged approach that all our um, tenants and, and building owners need to achieve. The, the process involved a high consultation of industry, and it was really purposely uh, done in the way, uh, in that way, to make sure we heard firsthand from everybody involved in the whole life cycle of the fit out, the key challenges and opportunities that they saw in in that process. Really understanding what they're already doing, what's uh, what's getting in the way, and then also understanding where the priority areas need to be, so we can really shift the dial and enable further change. You can see here a list of all the organizations that were involved. We conducted initially a symposium um, to really uncover all those challenges and, and really also understand right what the circular fit out toolkit, uh, circular fit out life cycle looks like, who is involved when, what's really required, and what are key decisions um, are made at each step, who is driving that decision, so we could really understand where those leverage points would come from in the life cycle. Then we also organize a couple of testing workshops to bring to the industry um, the, the draft of the toolkit and play back with them what we understood the symposium uncovered to really be able to check um, what's going to work, what's not going to work. How do we make the toolkit as practical as possible to help um, its application? So from those conversations, the main opportunities that were identified were really around the planification of circularity from the start. Um, being really early in the process and giving ourselves the time to talk about it and anticipate some potential different decisions we'd need to make to allow for that circularity to occur is really critical. And that's what we've been looking at through the, uh, in the toolkit development. Cost of reuse of solutions um, and low carbon products, the, you know, there's actually efficiencies and benefits that we can really uh, harness. So we've looked at this. Design for disassembly and standardization were also a critical enable, um, activity that people recognize being important. Education also for tenants and the whole uh, value chain, I guess, was critical. And taking that holistic sustainability approach. So we're not just trying to achieve circularity on its own, but really looking at all the sustainability challenges that tenants or building owners need to tackle. Collaboration also is uh, is a great opportunity for us to, to tackle. So as you can see, most of those opportunities come from that early stage uh, where we decide what sort of design approach we're going to put forward and also the procurement strategy that we're going to implement. The challenges, on the other hand, were um, a cost concern or perception of higher costs by applying circular solutions. 
some some level of uncertainty around the quality and the reusability of assets or materials which need to be addressed and there's great players in the market that are actually doing um, a fantastic job at addressing that challenge um, design for disassembly and standardization why it, it, it presents being an opportunity it is also a challenge because it's not well established or um, scaled up across the industry lack of awareness and knowledge is definitely something that we need to address and hopefully with the toolkit and those um, events that we're running that will help uh, shift the dial and help people understand what the size of the prize is. Um, finally, around those limitations, uh, we identified lease restrictions that uh, sort of limits the pre-planning activities. And it was great to see a lot of um, business uh, building owners on board to look at how do we further enable circularity in the lease process. And finally, um, the fragmentation and complexity of the value chain together with limited supply op supplier option is something that we really need to look at addressing. So while the tool toolkit will give some really practical action for, for everybody to, to um, drive, we will also need some level of changes across the industry to make it more um, effective. So at the back of those investigation and, and great uh, collaboration with industry, we created a toolkit that's made of five key modules it is targeted mainly at designers, um, at the design team, architects, but there are uh, the front section is really for everybody to get across and understand because that sets us up for success. It looks at um, level um, setting up for everybody some good foundational knowledge around what circular fit out look like, what it means, what it why is it important, the key players across the value chain, and what what everybody's role is in that process. We also look at uh, fit out enablers. So how do we also enable that circularity, some critical activities that will touch on everybody's um, uh, responsibilities. And then the third, the last three modules are really for the designers to drive the right conversation at the pre-design, concept design and detail design um, with the tenants and all the stakeholders involved to ensure we can achieve that. Um, as also mentioned by Gabby, um, you know, there's a strong alignment with the GBCA Green Star feed out rating. So we've taken that into, con into consideration in the design of the modules and um, making sure that those action will help um, apl applicants for the Green Star feed out rating to achieve those outcomes. I'll now hand over to Emily. Thanks, Jenny. I'm Emily Hendricks, I'm also joining from Aracon today, and I'm going to introduce you to Module 1. Um, so as Jenny just pointed towards, Module 1 was designed for everyone. Um, this should be used by the design team, by owners and by occupiers. And the purpose of this is to create a common language um, and establish the basics so that the whole team knows what we're working towards. So. First off, what do we mean by circular economy and how can you talk about this across the value chain? So circular economy approaches shift the way assets and products are designed, manufactured, consumed and discarded. There are four ways it does this. So the first is by designing out waste, using resources efficiently and removing harmful chemicals from the supply chain. So this can prevent waste being generated. We can slow the loop. So extend the lifespan of products and materials by champion product longevity and repairability. We can also close the loop. Um, so often what people think of when they think about circular economy is recycling. That's just one part of the bigger puzzle. Um, but this is where we keep materials at their highest value through effective recycling systems. And lastly, but most importantly, um, regenerating nature. So how are we building natural capital through our product and material selections? Um, by ensuring that we can safely return biological material to the earth, by choosing renewable materials, um, and then by using less land for material sourcing and ensuring that our designs help to clean land, air and water. Circular approaches are essential to adopt um, because they will help us achieve net zero targets. Um, adoption of renewable energy and energy efficiency measures will get us about 55% of the other way there. So the other 45% will be achieved by the emissions that are associated with products and material production. Jenny, if we can pop to the next slide. When we're talking about fit outs, um, we're talking about a small element of the building at play. So in the building sharing model here on the side, we can see the levels of lifetime and, and, and intervention um, that we could be working with. Um, the circular fit out, 
toolkit focuses on the stuff and the space plan. So when we talk about stuff, we're talking about furniture, lighting, IT, um, and then the solid internal fit outs. And, and these are some of the shortest lifetimes um, across a building system. So we are filling a gap um, in the sustainability decision making by focusing on these products and have established three strategies which we'll introduce to extend the functional life of these products and components designed for disassembly and designed for modularity so that we can make these last longer in the building life cycle. On to the next slide. We've looked across the fit out life cycle to establish where the toolkit can focus. And that's on those first four stages of the design. This was done throughout that co-design process uh, through the symposium and the testing workshop workshops where we identified that early intervention was essential. So broken into seven key stages, we first got stage one, the need for office and space selection, stage two, lease negotiations, stage three, the fit out design, which we've further broken into three design phases and stage four, the procurement of the fit out. We've mapped the different key activities and points of intervention across these stages and then within them to the design phases to prioritise how we integrate circularity practices into initial planning and design. This means that stakeholders can maximise potential for reuse, repurposing and material conversion. The toolkit focuses on how to collaborate and engage with stakeholders across these stages. We've also established this space particularly because it fills a gap within other BBP resources. BBP had already established uh, the tenant engagement document, um, so the foundation report that focuses across all of these seven design stages. Around stage two, there are the leasing standards, and around stage five, to the end of lease, we've got the strip out waste guidelines and then the operational waste guidelines for those, those middle bits. So we saw that there was a real need, and we heard from industry that there was a need to establish some guidance in that early stage. Um, so the links to those other BBP resources should be shared in the chat with you now. The toolkit itself frames actions around those C3 circular design strategies. This comes from a long list of actions and strategies that were developed along with stakeholders. So this is not exhaustive. Um, but based on what we heard from the symposium, we narrowed it down into three circular design strategies in addition to enablers that cut across all of these strategies that are most applicable to fit outs. Um, we undertook this through an assessment and prioritization activity. So first we have modular design. Modular design means that interior components and structures are uniform, adaptable and reusable. Elements are interchangeable and can be reconfigured, customised and used on-site or off-site in different spaces. Related to this, design for disassembly means that products and interior components can be easily taken apart and reused at the end of life or the renewal of the fit-out. It focuses on enabling end-of-life recovery by employing design strategies to facilitate component separation, such as correlation between material lifespan standardization of connections and configuration of service systems for ongoing services. And finally, extending life. Products and material selections are fit for purpose. Products, furniture and services can be fixed and repaired. So this involves designing and implementing durable, high quality materials and furniture that prolong the useful lifespan of office interiors and reduce the need for frequent replacements and renovations. There are two enablers that cut across all of these strategies. And these are our essential starting points. And if you were to take one thing away today, it's, it's to look at these and start with a digital asset register and circular procurement guidelines for all fit outs, because these will help guide action across the other three strategies. Back to our life cycle mapping. Um, the engagement demonstrated that while occupiers are the main decision maker, they're only engaging with the fit out process infrequently. 
once every five to 10 years. Comparatively, designers and owners are interacting with the fit out design day in, day out. This is their bread and butter. This makes them key advocates for circular design across the fit out life cycle and help to guide action with the occupiers, but also with other suppliers across the fit out value chain. So this page acts as a bit of a playbook to guide occupiers, design team and owners through circular considerations and actions across the fit out design and procurement life cycle. Um, so we can see around stage one and stage two when we're establishing the kind of space we want and entering into those lease negotiations. One of those first initial questions is what are your priorities and how can you approach them with circularity in mind? As we move into the first phase of design, into that pre-design phase, we start asking how can we make the most of what we already have and how much can we reuse from the current space, whether that's an existing fit out and that's being moved or, or transferred to another space or whether that's starting with a warm shell fit out. As we look at concept design, how can I ensure that I make the most over space over time and minimise the environmental impacts of products and materials? into detail design, how is it easy to maintain and how can the components and elements that are selected in this phase be planned for the next life? And in stage four, when we're looking at procurement of a fit out, how do these purchases enable circularity? How are we also examining reuse strategies in this phase of life? You can see um, we've also got little links here to where you can find this page with further detail in the toolkit we're just highlighting the, the key facts online in the webinar today. This page takes us through what you'd see on the action card. Um, so we've got the actions throughout the toolkit and on each page you'll see uh, a short statement describing the action giving some hints about how to engage stakeholders in key considerations along the supply chain, whether that's your suppliers, whether that's the design team, whether that's the occupier yourself. A small Australian case study to see how, what this looks like in action. Um, and along the bottom, there's ways to execute, ways to measure and expected outcomes. Um, in the top of each page, it's mapped to the design phase and the ambition level and the circular fit out strategy. And this is a little bit of a guide of how you might like to approach it or how you could print it off and use it with your clients in a workshop, for example. Each action is aligned to a different level of ambition. So we've noted where something might be the first step or, or the foundational step, and it might give users a place to start start thinking about new ways to think about space, products or materials, um, but should be achievable in most situations. The momentum builder is our, our next step, the intermediate step that helps you progress, um, but will require some deeper consideration of the interconnectedness of fit out materials and components. And then our advanced moonshots are ambitious in the current landscape. All the fit out stakeholders need to be aligned on commitment and it's going to require some resource to achieve these actions. And the establishment of these ambition levels was factored into our, our assessment and analysis process based on the maturity of the market, um, the maturity of the supplier market as well came into this consideration. On our next slide, you can see how our strategies, our ambition levels, um, have related to our actions and our four modules around enablers, pre-design, concept design, and detailed design. This page is a bit of a starting point um, by which you can examine which, how you'd like to tackle, tackle the toolkit. Um, we'd say there's no expectation for anyone to necessarily undertake this and, and do every single action that we've listed, um, but this is more of a guide about how you might like to play with these actions with your clients. So one approach would be to, to say that you're going to go through and, and try and do all of the first steps. Um, so you might talk with the occupier, with your client team to go through design simplification, floor plan adaptability, and then selecting materials and products with an identified end use market. Um, 
another way you might do it is by looking at themes. So is there a particular story that your client wants to tell with their fit out? Um, do they prioritise reuse, in which case you might look at reusing and reconditioning existing components um, and designing for maintainability? Or are they an innovative startup um, is doing things new and better their focus, in which case you might look to trying something new. So adopting product or service schemes um, and looking at designing new connection systems for easy coupling and decoupling. I think what we would say is that it's most important to get started if you're going to start anywhere with a digital asset register. Um, and this doesn't necessarily have to be high tech or, or through a third party supplier. Um, it can be an Excel document uh, with a number of categories that you record. But if you don't know what you have available in your fit out, you don't know what you have to work with as you move on to the next steps. Um, so I will now hand over to Vanessa, who will tell us more about the enablers and digital asset registers. Thanks so much, Emily. I'm Vanessa Cullen from Forward Thinking Design and FTD Circular. So if we could just go to the next slide. So I'm just here to talk about the digital asset register and Emily just gave a fantastic introduction to this. So essentially, as she said, if you don't have a register of what you've put into a fit out, then it's very hard to maintain that fit out to extend the life cycle of the materials, fixtures, fittings and furnishings. And it's very difficult to do anything with the items at the end of the fit out. So at D fit point. It's also very difficult for suppliers who are providing product as a service to be able to take back um, their assets and use those to recycle, resale, et cetera, if that link has been lost between their supply into your fit out and then your defit at the end. So the idea with the digital asset register is to keep the information about the products, whether that's care and repair, what they're made out of, um, maybe it's a material passport, all of those things connected to to the actual assets on site, to the materials, fixtures, fittings, furniture, et cetera. So that's why we want to keep a digital asset register. You can imagine it's kind of like if you pulled apart an IKEA flat pack and then you realize I've lost the instructions, you can't put it back together again. So you can see that it affects everything across the spectrum, including modularity and the ability to reuse um, modular items on site later on in perhaps the next fit out or in your next fit out. Uh, so it's really critical that we do keep an asset register. So as you can see here, um, knowing what's what you've got on site increases the disassembly and reassembly rates because then you know how to do it. Um, then you also understand what the properties were of the items that you have on site. Um, so as I said, it could contain a materials passport. Um, it will also help you to be able to recycle those, those assets at the end of life because, again, you know what's in them. Um, and it will also help with the repair, maintenance and refurbishment as well. Okay, if we could just go to the next slide. So on this slide here, we've got FTD Circular's digital platform. And like you heard, I mean, you can use any sort of platform, but the way in which we've used ours and we've established ours was really to allow people to compare different specifications for circularity at the design point. And then once the contractors get on site using their mobile phones, they can actually use barcoding or RFID to scan in the items that they're installing and record the details of those. So you can then ensure that what you've got on site matches your specification and that there has hasn't been any sort of variation as well. Then you can manage everything throughout the life cycle of the fit out using the platform. So you can call out like service repairs, maintenance. And when it comes to DFIT, this information allows you to connect the fixtures, finishes, et cetera, back to the supplier that they came from and to understand what they were made out of as well. So as you can see, it pretty much enables the full circularity. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. So in terms of circular procurement guidelines, this is where we all, we, we get everyone in, in the, the um, team for the fit out on board. So it's where we agree on the aims and the goals and the values around what our circular procurement is going to look like. And we embed circularity as a key consideration right up front for everyone. So it's, it's really about having that consensus. Um, so circular procurement guidelines, again, they set the aim, they set the intention and the rules that we're going to abide by to to attempt to attain circularity. So of course you can absolutely understand why that's really important. 
So basically it ensures that circularity is prioritized and built in right from the very beginning um, around the, the procurement of the products, the components, the materials, and even the services as well, such as logistics and design. So we're really embedding circularity up front. So if you can go to the next slide. So this is an example of um, a procurement guideline that we worked on with City of Casey. So in this case, we started doing a um, circular economy project with City of Casey. And right at the very beginning, we identified that their procurement guidelines were more focused on recycled content and sustainability and less so on circularity. Um, so really what we were taking is a full picture approach. Now, council were great. They agreed, yes, okay, we need to update these. So we worked on updating their procurement guidelines. And this is still a work in progress too, but they've already made some considerable changes. And just in the course of our short project last year, we were able to add 14 local organizations and charities as potential suppliers and recipients to council and the local circular economy as a whole. Because basically now they were starting to recognize the importance of reuse and the importance of secondhand and not just how much recycled content was in the things that they were putting into their fit out. So you can see it really expanded their view and enabled circular economy in KC. So now I'd like to hand over to Gabby. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Gabriella from the Circular Economy team at Oricon. And I'm going to take you through some of the pages of the toolkit so we can see some of the actions there and how we can actually properly implement them. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, during the pre-design, one of the actions that we have is reuse and recondition of existing components. This essentially translates into opportunities to retain materials and components from the existing fit out or even um, the new project site into the new development. This can be a somewhat simple and cost-effective way to minimize waste and save resources. There are some important considerations to take with the different project team members. Um, so we can see that um, the occupiers need to audit the existing or future fit outs to, so we can actually see what can be reused, what can be repurposed or reconditioned. Uh, the design team needs to really embrace this opportunity to use these um, savaged uh, materials and components into the design. Um, there is also a need to really specify these components and systems so that once they reach the end of life, they actually can be reused and reconditioned into new um, projects. And uh, importantly, we also need to consider how the tenancy agreement clauses specify retention of existing components. Um, so it really is a valuable practice in feed out um, processes, but it needs to start very early in the design stage. That's why I added as um, the pre-design. Um, the site audit needs to be undertaken as early as possible so we can identify the eligible components. Um, and besides the uh, project team members, there are some right partners that need to be engaged. So for example, social enterprises to take old materials, organizations to repair and refurbishment, for example. Um, we have a really nice case study. I'm going to hand over to Jenna Keen out to talk a little bit about the Charter Hall um, new workplace. Thank you, and hello again. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about how applying circular economy principles to the design of our workplace, our headquarter at number one Martin Place in Sydney helped us reduce carbon by material re uh, reuse um, and through targeted fit out uh, at our for our um, workplace, uh, a, a key criteria of the fit out was focusing on what we could recover and reuse instead of um, sending to uh, sending to landfill. To achieve this, we reused about seventy percent of our original furniture, and the remaining thirty percent was donated to social enterprise to give it a second lease of life. Um, through this, we avoided just under one hundred and fifty tons of carbon, which is equivalent to about. 53% um, reduction in embodied carbon compared to a typical fit out. Uh, we also reused about 70% of our carpet and internal partitions and nearly 50% of um, the joinery. 
Uh, we also found, uh, you know, uh, reused and recovered um, other materials, specifically timber and marble, which we had quite a bit of within our uh, previous fit out. And we used the timber for um, flooring, uh, from flooring to connect um, stairways that we had that we now have in our new uh, workplace, as well as the marble was then used in, in boardroom furnishings. Our workplace also embedded uh, sustainable practice through energy efficient lighting and low water use fitting and positively contributed to our people's well-being aligned with our commitment under the well building standard. Um, as an organization, we have a commitment to 100% uh, renewable energy and in line with that are all of our workplaces, including our um, head office at, Mar at Martin Place is powered by 100% renewable electricity as well. I'll hand over back to Gabby and happy to take any questions on this uh, later in the chat. Thank you, that is such a great example. Um, all right, so continuing in the toolkit, during the concept design, if you can go to the next slide, please. We have recommended, uh, one of the actions that we have recommended is the product as a service schemes. So this action is around choosing these schemes that instead of the full acquisition of a physical product, they work with a payment for the use or the access of that same product. So this has a lot of benefits because we are changing the ownership and responsibility from the customer to the provider. So it really encourages the prioritization of quality, durability, um, and maintenance during the whole life cycle of an asset. Um, this action really requires everyone from the project team to be involved in it. We need, you know, suppliers to offer these schemes. We need designers to properly include them in the specifications of the project. We need occupiers pushing for this type of product. And very importantly, we need to consider the budget allocation for this. So that's going to change, you know, from a lump sum to an over the lifetime kind of thing. So we are going to have assets changing from um, KPACs to OPACs and that needs to be properly allocated. And the financial re responsibility needs to be properly allocated as well, right? Um, we have a good case study. If you go to the next slide, a good example of this being implemented is this Leaving Edge um, Lifecycle Program. This is a model that delivers furniture as a service based on a monthly fee. So they create this service package that's going to be tailored to each organization's needs. Um, and they track and they register all of the different assets. Um, they have a really interesting research that states that uh, this leasing model can halve the life cycle embodied carbon of chair um, assets. Because basically what it's doing is extending the life cycle of this product and maximizing the use of it. And um, within their service, there is also a stewardship commitment that's going to focus on keeping high quality products in use for multiple life cycles before they are retired through sustainable end of life pathways, right? So they carry out, they also carry out um, audits for existing furniture assets. They help to identify the best procurement strategy and they provide um, asset management. So it's a really attractive option for both the businesses and the consumers in terms of sustainability, in terms of flexibility, uh, and with economic benefits as well. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. For the detail design, we have um, recommended um, one of the actions that we have is the connection systems for easy coupling and decoupling on site. That is a moonshot ambition level. It's a bit more complex, but still a very interesting and well worth one. It refers to the design of these reversible connections between the components so they can be easily assembled and disassembled and, you know, repaired. Um, the goal is really to streamline these processes of assembly and disassembly to reduce the downtime and enhance flexibility. So some examples on how that can be executed could be the use of bolted, screwed, and nailed connections, the smart configuration of systems so to optimize the correlation of the component's lifespan so they have this uh, similarity in the service life, and uh, favor prefabricated assets. Designing these components with these connection systems in mind from the beginning, it's very essential to get the most out of the end of, li or end of service life. But some main considerations need to be taken, though. So mechanical, plumbing, and electrical engineers need to ensure 
the accommodation of these components in their systems for easy access. The supplier needs to provide proper documentation, proper manuals, so when the end of life comes, this is a, the disassembly can actually happen. Um, and the design team needs to detail all of these solutions and connections into the design and work together so that the components' lifespans are really correlated. Um, as a case study, if you go to the next slide, um, we'll introduce you to X-Frame. So X-Frame is a modular design system for building partitions and internal walls. So if you see on the left there, you can see the 257, which is a co-working office in New Zealand. Um, so when we think of co-working offices, it's a type of design that's probably going to require, you know, quick adaptation based on changes of users who come and go, based on changes of working practices. So it's a great example of this adaptability necessity. 16 meters of walls were deployed, um, 460 standard X-frame parts were used, which generated roughly 200 kilograms of carbon sequestrated. Um, and in the picture, you can see that they used sheet metals that are designed to just clip into the wall partition behind. So it's really easy to assemble and disassemble, and you can get um, access to the internal walls as well. On the right, you can actually see the A and Z end field feed out. Um, they have actually, the X-Frame actually worked together across different locations to customize wall framing system. And this is an example of one location. Um, this makes sense for banks um, where the branches might need to grow or they might need to change or update quickly. Um, the product for the end field fit out took about six week, weeks off site to be manufactured. And then once it was on site, it was constructed and verified in about four days. So you can see that besides the environmental outcomes, we have speed and a short length of disruption as benefits as well. So I'm gonna hand over to Jenny now for some next steps. Oops. Thank you, Gabby. Um, so hopefully that was a instructive um, presentation of the toolkit and what it can deliver. There's obviously a lot more details in, in the document. So I really encourage everybody to download it and have a proper read. And it's kind of also a bit of a choose your own adventure. You can you know, select to read it per strategy or per level of ambition. So it's really up to you in terms of how you want to use it. Now, obviously, um, this is not a silver bullet. This is not going to fix the whole um you know, all the challenges that we're facing in the circular, uh, in the fit out industry, there are a range of um, macro level, system level change that we will we'll need to drive as, um, as an industry. So first of all, to address some of the challenges that came up in the, the consultation, you know, the level of awareness and engagement and, and knowledge around circular fit out is critical. So I would really encourage everybody on the call here to, you know, share this resource, talk about circularity, and really galvanize the industry to adopt those practices. Um, it needs to be, you know, adopted in, in conjunction with all the other resources that are available. And there are a lot already on the BBP website. GBCA is obviously updating the Green Star rating and really looking at how do you approach this holistically. Um, we would really encourage industry association and, um, you know, programs like BBP, AIA, DIA, FIA, all the acronyms you can see um, in this space to build the capacity of the industry through workshops. There was a strong requirements when we discussed with all the industry stakeholders that um, for collaboration and networking, you know, people uncovered in the symposium some really cool ideas and initiatives that everybody was doing on their side, but it's not socialized and people are not aware of what's happening. So those opportunities to share knowledge, share learnings, share also what didn't work because it's, it's a trial and error process um, is really valuable because it builds confidence for people to try to adopt those practices and see that they're not by themselves. Other people are also on that journey. Um, to also enable this, it is going to be critical to have a resource hub or a supplier directory really facilitate for um, all the industry to understand who is doing this kind of uh, alternative approach to, um, to fit out. Uh, where are those social enterprises that can help us at the start? Reuse, repurpose, repair, upgrade. Where are the suppliers that provide product as a service or those that help you navigate your digital asset register or uh, better maintenance programs? So this is going to be quite critical um, as well. 
policy regulation and incentive obviously will be required uh, from government, and it, uh, it is something we need to keep pushing for. But it doesn't mean that we should just wait uh, around to see those things happen. There's definitely a range of activities that everybody is already doing or could be doing more of uh, without regulation or incentives really driving that. And uh, just to reflect on a comment as well that, that was made uh, in the Q&A, uh, tax depreciation, like the whole accounting system right now definitely doesn't support circularity. Um, so there's things that we need to change on that front as well. And it's all about advocating and pushing for those change to happen. And then finally, technology is obviously a critical enabler. Um, you know, having access to standardized material databases or passports, uh, understand uh, where to source the product through digital or online marketplaces would be really valuable for the industry to uh, leverage together with the toolkit. So we really encourage everybody to use the toolkit talk about it, but also take their, their leadership, um, you know, role in the industry to drive the right conversations and to shift the dial on that system level change that we need. So then applying the toolkit is even easier uh, as we move forward. I will probably close here and leave the floor for some questions. So um, I will probably stop sharing screen so we can see all our speakers. And I'll have a look at what the questions, uh, what the questions are. So I think there were some questions coming up for Janaki to just deep dive a little bit more on the, the fit outs project that you presented. Um, discussed questions around, you know, the price um, of the fit outs, uh, whether demolition was, uh, you know, is usually cheaper, um, the average uh, life, you know, you, uh, age of the assets that were reused, whether, you know, how do you determine whether you can use them for longer? Um, so if you could expand a little bit on this, Janaki, it would be great. Yep, sure. Thank you. Um, and great questions. Thank you for your questions. Um, so in terms of one of the questions there in relation to the age of some of the furniture and the, the materials, it varied quite a bit. So a lot of our um, desks and chairs were, I think most of it was reused within the space. Uh, a lot of our joinery, our carpet was reused um, and it really varied. So where it was relatively new because a lot of our office material were maintained and were procured originally to have a long life. And of course, if they were they were broken or they were they were damaged, then they were repaired where they could and where they couldn't, um, you know, we couldn't work with it any further. And so we find we we tried to find, um, you know, uh, organizations that could actually uh, repair and recover them. Um, so it really depend like it depended on the material. So from that perspective, we just worked with uh, what we had at, uh, from the in terms of the materials and the furniture and the and the joineries that we we had. I think there was another question um, in relation to. Uh, the the carbon the calculation of the carbon and um, you know compared to a typical fit out that's a really good question I think we really struggled with that and I think we still struggle with that in when we look at you know other uh, fit outs for our tenant customers and and other cases because there really isn't a benchmark for our workplace we looked at what uh, a typical fit fit out would be when we if we were to do it for another of our workplaces. So if we were not to reuse that carpet just from an EPD or information from our suppliers, what that emission would be, and then compared that to based on the weight that we did end up uh, reusing and calculated it based on that. So I wouldn't say it's, uh, you know, based on uh, some kind of a standard, um, but at the same time, we took the information that we got from our suppliers, looked at the uh, product details and then try to work through based on estimates of what that emission reduction would look like. Excellent. Thank you, Janakin. I really love that um, spirit of still going for it, even though we don't have all the answers in the way to really measure everything. Um, it is still, um, you know, there is definitely benefits that you've been able to quantify and whether the method is perfect is another question, but it's how we, you know, trying trial and error is really the way to help us progress the thinking in that space. Absolutely. And um, that's in the spirit of this toolkit as well. So um, thanks. Let me know if there are any other questions that I've missed. I mean, just on that potentially, uh, just to expand, um, obviously the budget question uh, keeps coming back. Um, so could you share with us a little bit around how you manage the challenge of the cost and is it actually cheaper? Are there ways to demonstrate efficiencies um, and how do you convince your 
you know, decision makers in that process? Look, I think we've got to be realistic about it. Whilst it's definitely a key criteria and a goal for Charter Hall and was a, a, a very uh, intentional criteria for this particular fit out for our workplace, it has to be commercially viable. And so we worked and I mean, the other factor that perhaps isn't really um, discussed is is the is the waste to landfill that you know was mentioned as part of this presentation earlier that usually there is a cost to that as well it's usually about depending on the size and scale of your fit out it's about anywhere between two to five percent of your fit out for capital works budget um, and so identifying ways to claim a lot of that back reuse it in par through partnerships and and other uh, uh, um, engagements it it kind of does help um, you know reduce the cost from that angle, but also then considering, um, you know, if if ultimately if you don't need to buy additional furniture, well, there you go. You've, you've just saved a whole line item in your budget. Um, if you can repair something and recover something or reuse or reutilize it, and you've just got to find the right partners. Um, and I'm not saying it's easy. It hasn't been. Um, but because we have that as a key criteria, as an intention, just to, again, test and learn, for ourselves, um, it, that's how we really um, achieved what we did for this particular workplace. Thanks, Janaki. I just wanted to quickly say, while we still have a lot of people on the call, one of the questions was around, is the toolkit free and is it online? And yes and yes um, is the answers to both of those questions. Um, it's online now and, and we'll pop it in the chat again. Um, we'll make sure that you all know how to get your hands on that. And just to complement what you just said, uh, Mary, this is asking whether the slides will be shared. Uh, this session is recorded and it will be uh, available on the GBCA YouTube channel. So you can definitely access that again um, and have that walkthrough. Um, this is, those are um, snippets of the toolkit that were slightly simplified just to be a little bit more visual, but all the content is in the toolkit as well. So, uh, you can yeah, go back to the video if you need as well. We had also a question around um, a preferred carbon calculation tool for feed our element. Um, this is a very, very good question. I will throw it to the team. Do you have any preferred one that you use? Because to my knowledge, there's not a standard one. But maybe looking at you, Vanessa, is there a particular one that you like using? Um, we've taken a bit of a different approach, to be honest. So what we've been trying to do is put into our platform um, the information out of EPDs from both, um, I guess, like products that are currently in the market, but also put in some uh, generic EPD information that's been supplied to us for a range of different parties. Um, so, for example, like the EPIC database, um, which comes through the University of Melbourne, and there's a bunch of others which I could supply links for as well. Um, and look at the information that's actually in those rather than using a calculation tool, mostly because we've been, our, most of our clients have been looking at the DFIT side of things and, you know, um, trying to understand embodied carbon in those. So it depends on whether you're trying to use a calculation for your design and your specification up front um, versus if you're actually looking at the DFIT side of the circularity. It's a big question to answer because there's things like one-click LCA, et cetera, if you're going to use it up front for the specification procurement, but that might not really cover like the questions that you need when you're looking at the DFIT perspective and maybe the second fit out. So when you're defitting from one fit out and then you're going to do like reuse and all that sort of thing, there's not a calculator for that at the moment. So we're actually using our platform to try and bridge that gap. Um, but it is a really evolving space at the moment. Yeah, I would also add to that. Um, you mentioned one click. You can conduct life cycle assessments uh, at the start and sort of take that whole of life approach mm -hmm. on your project. It is a cost consideration, though, and something that you need time at the start to factor in to be able to to use the output as a you know decision making tool. So, um, yeah, I think the EPD and looking at like available data provided by the supplier already, if they are issuing an EPD, that's a good sign that they're focusing on their carbon emission uh, as they're transparently sharing that information with the market. Any other commentary from the GBCA team on on how? this is being solved through the work that you do with your rating tools? 
um, Jenny, can I just point out that in the toolkit for each one of the actions, we have a ways to measure section. So there are some, you know, tools and frameworks and um, methods for each one of the actions that we advise that they can um, use that for. Yeah. These don't always tackle um, a way to calculate the carbon, um, but because of the complexities involved, we have tried to identify sometimes where there are simpler measures that can be more easy to understand and can start your way along the process um, while maybe there's still an industry standard being developed. Yeah, so just on that, from the GBCA point of view, we have the upfront carbon calculator from the GBCA, and that is using the EPIC database. Um, so that's kind of the, the basic tool that we've got at the moment, but looking to get something that's a bit more comprehensive to look at that reuse element too. So like we've said, it's an evolving space and hopefully we'll have something down the line that can do it sort of more comprehensively. Thank you. Uh, just coming to a couple more questions and we've got a few minutes to finish off uh, with, with a couple of slides that we want to close the session with. Uh, Penny is asking whether we'll have a version for store fit out, retail and partial retail or office space. Um, I guess this is um, maybe a question for BBP um, if that's on the cards. Um, Samara or Katie, do you want to answer that? I can answer that. The BBP is focused on office. So in the very near future, unlikely, but who knows how the BBP might evolve in future. I think that's a nice call out for action in any leader in this space that's listening to this that needs a store application of it. There's already obviously some groundwork done here that could be transferable. So let us know if you can to have a tailored version. Yeah, I think, um, Jenny, to your earlier points, Module one is a really good place for everyone to start, regardless of the sector and the space that you're working within. Yeah, excellent. Uh, final question before we close. Um, this has been moved, so I guess it's been addressed or answered online. Let me double check. Uh, yeah, Vanessa, it would be great to understand the databases and the platform that you use. Um, and if you can share those, you can see that it's been uh, answered in writing. But anything to add here? Oh, yeah. I've popped the answer into the Q&A. So I couldn't type every single one, but there's a few. So. <laughs> Excellent. I guess we'll probably uh, leave it there. Obviously, if you have further questions, uh, you can contact Samara from the Data Buildings Partnership, who is the coordinator of that program. You can also contact me um, um, as part of the Oricon team, and you can also contact the GBCA, Taryn or Gabby will be able to address any questions that are relevant to them. Uh, and then I would like to thank everybody for taking the time in attending that session. We really hope this is a helpful uh, and actionable tool that the industry will be relying on. And I'll hand over to Gabby uh, from GBCA for a final call out to build from. Yes, again, thank you everyone. Um, and just one more kind of plug at the end, our Green Star Interiors Advanced course is coming up. So like I mentioned in the beginning, we will be looking for a way to recognize the use of this circular fit outs toolkit in the Green Star tools. So that will be the Green Star Interiors for now and down the line soon it will be the Green Star fit outs tool. So keep an eye out if you're interested. And again, this is looking at fit outs from a really holistic sustainability point of view. So not only are we looking at circularity and reuse, we're also looking at um, health and social impact and environmental issues. So worth checking out if you have not across it already. And thanks again, everyone. Excellent. Well, thank you for attending and thank you to the whole team. This was a true team effort, really great demonstration of collaboration in action and it's been a delight working with everybody so looking forward to the next steps uh, which is a specific master class being run next week for designers and architects to really deep dive into the practical nitty-gritty details of all the different steps you can apply in those actions so please join us if that's of interest next week thank you so much <laughs>